and then in the consumer has been helping to prop up this economy. We're hearing continued positive um, commentary from some of the banks this past week at the industry conference about the consumer. And so if the consumer gets concerned about, you know, possibility of job loss, then we could see uh, a stalling in consumer spending and that and that would not equate to our soft lending. All right. So would you suggest any kind of changes in an investor's portfolio uh, here on Wednesday, December 6th, or perhaps do you wait till after the Fed meeting next week, or do you just kind of sit tight and wait for 2024? I think at this point, the year has been already made, and you sort of sit tight and wait for, for next year. And if you do get a pullback in the, in the market, assuming that the growth data still holds in there, then you might want to consider buying that dip. Um, I mean, the market has had a pretty strong rally. But from a position standpoint, we're maintaining our position in terms of being positive on tech into 2024. 20, um, we do think that there's opportunity in energy, on, particularly on this pullback. It's been very painful in the last couple of months in energy. And then you want to add some, you know, defensive exposure in terms of consumer staples. But overall, we think that you want to maintain a quality portfolio. So those stocks that really continue to deliver a high return on invested capital, those stocks that still have those companies that have strong balance sheets. What kind of pullback could we see? You could see some some consolidation here, some digestion, which we actually think would be healthy for this market after such a massive rally, the best that we have seen all the all year. And we did have a strong year to begin with. And so some consolidation would be healthy, but we think that that's likely to be short-lived. You still have some potential seasonal factors that, that could be at play here, the typical Santa Claus rally in the January effect. Um, and you still have some buybacks that could help support this market. And overall, you have the earnings recovery. So that's why we don't think that there's much downside to this market. The earnings recovery should continue to gain some momentum into 2024. Well, that's what I want to ask you fundamentally. Like, right, we can all speculate about what the Fed's going to do, what they're going to say, but ultimately they're going to say and do what they want to uh, when when they meet and discuss, and then we'll get the outcome. But having said that, fundamentally, when you look at valuations, and there's a lot of different ways, right, to dice and slice uh, in terms of market caps or growth versus uh, value. But when you look at it, do you feel like fundamentally there is room more for equity gains? Yes. I mean, you finally have earnings back in the block. Um, the consumer is holding in there. And so we think that you can get high single digit earnings growth next year. And if the economy remains on solid fully, you could even get double digit growth. I mean, even like a sector like tech, where you say, wow, the sector is up a lot this year. Is there still more left to go? We think so, because when you look at tech, this is a sector that could deliver double digit growth next year for all stripping that of the market. It's not cheap. Yes, you know, but it just does have those improvement fundamentals that's happening and it does tick the box on the on the positive side of the ledger. And a lot of those things like I talked about quality in particular, and you are seeing continued momentum in AI. We heard that coming out of the UBS um, tech conference from last week. Mm -hmm. The tone, overall tone has been encouraging and you're seeing a bottom in, in uh, the semi-end market. So the point is that things are improving uh, for corporations, despite the fact that you might see some slowdown in that economic data. Interesting. All right. Good stuff. Hey, listen, thanks. And if we don't see you before uh, the end of the year, um, happy new year, happy holidays. Nadia Lavelle, Lovell, excuse me, of course, senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management, joining us on Zoom in New York City. Hey, everybody, just about 10 minutes left in the trading session. This is Bloomberg Radio.
Now, your company news headlines on Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Advanced Micro Devices CEO Lisa Su has introduced a new line of AI accelerator chips, and she's predicting that the market for such products could explode to more than $400 billion dollars in the next four years. Coming up in just under an hour, we will be interviewing AMD CEO Lisa Su right here on Bloomberg Business Week. And right now, we've got AMD shares down by about 1.2%. Global Airlines are poised to generate record revenue this year and will extend the gains in 2024 as the industry decisively shakes off the COVID-19 pandemic. Even as higher interest rates hold back profit growth, Bloomberg Radio caught up with Willie Walsh, the CEO and Director General of the International Air Transport Association. You know, so we're still in recovery stage. I, I think this is probably the last time I'll talk about re recovery because we're effectively back to where we were in 2019. Uh, always challenging with the general macroeconomic environment. Uh, you know, the global uh, geopolitical issues are impacting on the industry as well. But actually, we remain cautiously optimistic about uh, 2024. And uh, I think the recovery we've seen in 2023 has been very encouraging and should give the industry reason for optimism next year. And you can hear more of the conversation on the Bloomberg Brief podcast. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts among U.S.-based carriers with significant international routes. We've got UAL up 3.3%, American up 2.7%, Delta up 3.6%. Those are our top company stories. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Messer and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody, four and a half minutes left in today's trading session, getting ready to wrap up the trade. Uh, a lot going on. Uh, I feel like some big macro stories. I've been watching bank stocks. They've been on the move. Uh, actually hired today. has to do with really uh, some news we got out of um, City, but there's a financial services contract uh, contract conference uh, going on so that we've seen uh, some CEOs, big dudes uh, at the big banks talking about the environment. So, Yeah, and they've also been busy on Capitol Hill, too. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on uh, in terms of Kind of the back and forth, right? Yeah, Jamie Dimon. It's funny what makes news and yeah. what people tweet about and what they read about. This is if there's one thing to sort of come out from this this morning, and Let's we're going to talk acting. to Shanali about this. <laughs> I'm not an actor. I only play one on the radio. Uh, we'll talk to Shanali and Catherine Doherty about this in a few minutes. Uh, Jamie Dimon told U.S. lawmakers he would shutter the crypto industry if he had their power. Here's what he said: "Quote." If I was the government, I'd close it down. The CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase said, uh, "He doesn't like crypto. Let's be like, let's play like, let's lay it out there, right?" I mean, to say he doesn't like crypto, I think, is an understatement. Being kind, yeah. Let, he's he's, it, man. But but let's just Ponzi say he's schemes, he's been fraud. This is what the, the ways he's described. He's the been past. consistent. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's nice. what I will give him. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that actually. Uh, it's funny though. I mean, uh, this is it's like a rare sort of you know little bit of, of agreement that I think some some lawmakers have with uh, with uh, Jamie Dimon. Well, Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, Massachusetts Democrat, uh, using the hearing, the Senate Banking uh, Committee hearing, to team up with Republicans and banking leaders to take aim at the cryptocurrencies. Man, it's like people's favorite, like, beating up. But then as soon as, like, it's off and running, everyone's like, ah. I mean, crypto's back up at, what, 44,000? Bitcoin is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but who knows why? Yeah. I don't know why. I can't explain it. Yeah. Do you know why? No. It just seems like no. the... You and I, every time we do a crypto uh, interview, we're kind of like... Well, I think it matches sort of the euphoria that we've seen in the last five weeks in the equity market. Yeah. yeah. I think the, there's no other explanation. The risk trade is on. We've seen it uh, like yeah. kind of across the board, it feels like, in, yeah. in so many different asset classes. So, Jamie All right, Diamond, I'm gonna get some. I'll get some nice tweets now Jamie for saying Diamond, all this. Not. Whenever consistent. I talk about crypto, I get the, <laughs> the haters Shut it piling down. it on. Should have done. I think that's how he might have said it. I don't know. Uh, listen, we're going to talk about the markets. We're heading over to our TV colleagues. That's Gus Beyond the Bell. Starts right now. Beyond the Bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. 
And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlet Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast uh, where we're joined right now by Carol Masser, the pride of Barnard College, and Tim Stenevic. Welcome to our audiences <laughs> across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, what is it, originals, and a partnership with YouTube. Am I forgetting something? I like think that? you got it all. Check, okay. check, check, yeah. check. It's like there you've done go. this before. Yeah. I, mean. I try. Bloomberg.com. Yeah. How about Every that? Every now and then. Yeah, Bloomberg.com, folks. Yeah, you can watch us go. on Bloomberg.com, right? I think. Yes. Yes, of course yes. you can. And on the app. You, you better know. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Pride of Barnard anymore. Um, you know, what an interesting day. We've got stocks down. Were you the Pride of Barnard back in the day? <laughs> Well, You'd have was. to ask them. Thank you so much. I have to ask your old professor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, uh, let's move on. Um, that would so, actually be some real research. We actually, were talking a little. I did fairly well. Fa fairly well. Look where okay. I am. Look at where I landed. Well, I yes, yes, yes. You've done, you've done great, Kurt. I'm in great company. You've won, all, you've won all, so many awards. Yeah. I have. You want to talk about that instead of the markets? No, let's talk about the markets. <laughs> hey, right. you started it. <laughs> I did. I feel like I'm with my brothers. <laughs> um, uh, so here we go. Um, interesting day. We've seen certainly uh, investors moving into the banking area. We've had a banking conference going on, so we're getting commentary. City, uh, that news certainly got everybody's attention. Crypto, right? Bitcoin going above 44,000. Uh, it's been an interesting day in terms of where investors have been moving, kind of reacting in some cases to yeah, but some fundamentals. At the same time, seeing some selling into the close, especially on the NASDAQ. Uh, surprised that the uh, softness in the uh, ADP report that we initially led to some optimism and a risk on trade didn't necessarily stick for the day, but I guess everybody's looking to Friday. And Poor ADB. ADP. Nobody loves that report. They did earlier in the day. They just kind of blow it off. I, I actually love it. I mean, I know it's... Well, because the problem is people always look at it as being the definitive predictor of what's going to happen with the monthly report, but you can't do that. I mean, there's a lot of other data in there that's important beyond that headline number that I think does provide a lot of insight. So there's my plug for uh, nice. the folk, fine folks at ADP. Meanwhile, not necessarily a fine day in markets with all of the major indices of finishing the day in the red. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down about uh, 70 points or two-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 down 18 points or four-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite lower by about six-tenths of a percent, while the Russell 2000 going to finish the day modestly lower by two-tenths of a percent. All right, digging a little bit deeper into the indices, you mentioned the Russell Romain. So kind of an even split in terms of winners and losers in that index. And if I look at the S&P 500, same story. Uh, a little bit to uh, the upside, 277 names to the upside, 223 to the downside. But it's interesting, despite kind of finishing at our lows uh, uh, in terms of the headline, we did see some buyers in this market, Scarlett. We did, and some of those buyers headed into safe havens like utilities. Uh, the utilities index, or sub-index here, uh, gaining 1.4% on the day. Consumer durables, that's mainly home builders, lifting that group up by 1%. Consumer services also doing well. On the downside, with the drop in WTI below $70 a barrel, you have 22 out of 23 members of the S&P 500 energy index lower. The exception is Kinder Morgan, which is a pipeline company. Chip companies and software services companies also lower by about 1%. All right, to the individual gainers we go. Uh, Citigroup on mm -hmm. that list, uh, definitely finishing way off its highs of the day when it was up more than 5%. You did 5%. four again. Four gainers. <laughs> you don't like that, do you? All right, you? I'm going to go fast, okay? <laughs> I promise. She just makes me look if bad. If you don't interrupt me. Okay. All right, Citigroup up 2.5% in today's session. <laughs> Must uh, <not> interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't resist. Uh, the CFO was saying uh, at that Goldman Sachs uh, U.S. Financial Services Conference that the company's on track to deliver full year revenue in line with the firm's earlier guidance, although at the lower end of that 78 to $79 billion target. Nonetheless, investors liked it up 2.5%. Airlines, another conference underway. Delta sparking a rally in the airline sector. That stock finishing up 3.5% on the session. Uh, Delta coming out reaffirming its full year adjusted earnings per share forecast, um, actually ahead of a more Morgan Stanley Consumer Conference, so we'll look for some headlines as that conference gets underway. Um, Walgreens Boost Alliance, it was... Uh, it's, it's, it's underway, girl. Oh, is it? Yeah, okay. they spoke today. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt. You can interrupt me on that kind of stuff. Um, Walgreens uh, Boots Alliance, uh, top in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100, although I think it's kind of moved down a little bit among the top gainers in the S&P. Uh, it's down more than 40% year to date. Um, it's kind of tagging on a rally, a two-day rally of CVS Health, which is up, as B of A says, CVS has appropriately reset expectations for earnings growth over the uh, intermediate term. So I don't know. That's what some of the analysis was. And then Starbucks, I had to mention, record losing streak of 12 down days. Whew. It's over. Yes. Dun, da, 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 up 1.6% uh, in today's no. session. Why? Um, 
It just is. Because it can't go down every it day. Just <laughs> it just is. The answer is because it can't <laughs> go down. Because we never answered why it was down for 12 days. I there thought was you concern maybe about, why it was I think up it was, today. analysts said there was a concern about cooling sales. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah but you could say that about so brew. much, right? I don't know. Um, stock lost 11%, though, in that um, 12 down day losing streak. So maybe people said, okay, now it's time to buy. I don't know. It just is. Sometimes okay. it just is. It's a reversion to the mean. How about that? Nice. Tim, what do you got? Well, how many, how many, people need how many to buy more got? Jack Daniels or Woodford Reserve because the worst performer on a percentage basis in the S&P 500 today was the parent company of those two alcohol brands. Brown Foreman finished it down 10.4%. Uh, actually, it's worst day since March of 2020. That's how far back you have to go to find a day where it fell uh, by more than 10.4%. The company did report earnings per share and a net sales for the second quarter that trailed estimates, even though expectations were low. Uh, Brown Foreman also cut its uh, organic net sales and operating income forecast for the full year. Investors selling that stock today. Uh, Ultimate Freightline, among the worst performers, the third worst performer on the S&P 500 on a percentage basis. The company did report year-over-year drop in revenue per day in November. Uh, shares finished the down by 5.6%. And then Asana, the application software company uh, that only went public a few years ago, finished the day down by more than 16%, falling the most in more than a year. The company did report revenue for the most recent quarter that came in below estimates. Uh, analysts said that there could be a, you know, there's still a weak economic environment that could be affecting the company's uh, stock price uh, and, of course, the company's business. Uh, there are concerns that growth could be sluggish as a result of the report that we saw late yesterday. HSBC and Morgan Stanley each cut their price targets on the stock shares down by, uh, yeah, more than uh, 16% today. And we should point out we saw something similar from some of the other uh, software companies as well uh, today. Uh, maybe that's start the start of some degree of a trend here. Uh, let's check in on the Treasury market right now because you are seeing a bit of a rally, particularly on the longer end of the curve, or resumption of that rally, I should say. Modest gains on the day that push yields down on the 10-year by about five, four to five basis points, and on the 30-year by about seven basis points. Now, we should point out, uh, Carol, that this does seem to be uh, that positioning that is now starting around the Friday morning uh, job support here in the U.S., where people really are really sticking out their positions as to whether we get a hot report, a cool report, or something in between. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Um, looking at Chewy in the aftermarket, guys, it's down about 9% here as it uh, reports earnings. Uh, company's third quarter net sales, it's light, uh, 2.7 just slightly light, $2.74 billion versus the estimate of $2.75 billion. Third quarter adjusted EBITDA, $82.1 million, estimate $65.2. Trying to see why investors are selling. I mean, the stock's down 50% this year, about a 20% um, short on this position, so looking for a little bit more in terms of an outlook or something, but stock down about 5% here. Well, People not paying up for their pets, that's yeah. unthinkable. Well, we should point out that, that net mar <laughs> the net margin did contract in the quarter, too, did it? so that, okay. that could be an issue. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. let's take a look Sometimes at GameStop, possible. which uh, doesn't have any earnings, and again, it has a loss for the quarter, adjusted loss per share for the third quarter, 18 mm -hmm. cents. Analysts were looking for a loss of 7.7 .7 cents, so that's a lot worse than expected. Mm -hmm. Net sales for the period, $1.08 billion. Analysts were looking for $1.18 billion. So a uh, miss on sales and a miss on the bottom line yeah. as well. Sorry. Well, guess what? Yeah. They're not even having a conference call today. From <laughs> yeah. Me. Sorry, I, I have my hand yeah. raised, Tim. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how this works on, on the show. But but yeah, there's no conference call. And, and speaking of that, did you actually look at the press release? Yeah, it says. One, two, three, four, five. It's like seven lines long. And then the last line is the company will not be holding a conference call today. But you can look <laughs> yeah. for the 10Q. I, I would 10Q. just like. I would just like to point out the disclosures, the, 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 the oh, regulatory wow. disclosures are actually longer, way longer than the press release itself here. Yeah, well, when is the point. turnaround? So what does that say uh, well, about it hasn't happened this yet? company? When, when GTA 6 comes out, that's when the turnaround happens. <laughs> but... <laughs> I know we're laughing because we don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I mean, but this, I mean, in all seriousness, this, I mean, what, I mean, what is the strategy? I mean, I mean, he's never really articulated it, at least not to a way that folks liked. And I think there was this idea that, well, with certain types of investors that have gravitated to the stock, you don't really need to do all the rigmarole with these long press releases and conference calls because people were buying into a story or narrative. But I haven't heard that story or narrative in some time. Well, there's stories, there's narratives, and then there's fundamentals, right? Uh, after this stock, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, in general. Yeah. Isn't it funny how uh, Chewy and GameStop actually have their results on the same day today? I mean, Ryan Cohen's <laughs> yeah, was original. That plan was that planned? I don't think so. But, I mean, that's originally why people were excited about GameStop. Look what he did at Chewy early on in Chewy's yeah. life. Uh, they thought he could do the same thing to GameStop, and that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. 
well, and he's now kind of the last person standing, right? He's basically basically the only adult out there right now. Maybe he's too busy turning it around to have an earnings call. Yeah, well, good Has for anyone him. seen Dumb Money? I think I know I've asked this before. Yeah. No, we had the um, producers on. Yeah. Oh. For Dumb Money. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. It was it was interesting. Exactly. Did you like it? Um, I did. I, I really liked seeing the cameos of all of Bloomberg TV on there. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Her name was on there a few times. All right. <laughs> is that believe- why you're talking about this? <laughs> oh, is that why? Now I have to go see it. Break it up. I don't get enough romance. I have to. to and we thought you were such a shy kind of guy. Me? Have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Hey, everybody say goodbye to Carol because you're not going to see her for a while. Where? Are you Wait, off? Carol, you're off on vacation? Um, she's tight lipped there. Who knows no, where she's, she's going? She's what nodding. She's I'm doing not the, great radio, I'm doing but she's the nodding. not buying stuff and experiencing stuff. Ah, uh, yes. You know, like, you know. Contributing to services. You got it. The services part okay. of the Well, don't forget, you have three people sitting next to you on the screen here who expect a little. Stuff. You like gifts? Is that what you're saying? I, I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> Particularly from a very valued friend uh, and, and, and associate. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, yeah. The sound's cutting out. All right, I gotta go. We gotta go. Otherwise, I'm gonna start yelling at us. Love you guys. Be well. Bye. Stay safe. All right, we'll see you. Um, Cross Pop from coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg it's Originals. <laughs> it's hard to say goodbye. See you. You know what, Carol? What? There are kind of like a few, I don't know, things that are just staples yeah. of the holiday season. So think about this for a second. Mm. Eggnog, mm. the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Love that. Carol's famous holiday cookies, which I'm told <laughs> include homemade shortbread and peppermint bark. Uh, yet, I've never actually eaten, but I've told that you do this every year. I've known you at this point for almost four years, and I still have never tried these. Um, but it's a holiday tradition. It is a holiday tradition. I'm trying to get back to the tradition. There's reasons why it's been on hold, but I know I owe you and a lot of people some cookies, so mm, we'll work on it. You we'll, don't have to. It's okay. <laughs> I'd love to. I'm a of balls. They're really good. All right, but in terms of traditions, one of the things we always look forward to is PNC Asset Management Group's Christmas Price Index. Uh, this index, or CPI, calculates the true cost of all 12 days of Christmas. So all the gifts... All of the calling birds, gold rings, swimming swans, milking maids, and pear trees. Amanda Agati is the chief investment officer at PNC Asset Management Group. She joins us on Zoom from Philadelphia. Amanda, good to have you back with us. You know I've been waiting 11 months for this. So much fun. We love doing this each and every year. Uh, I got to tell you, the headline number here is quite a bit different than last year and kind of makes sense when it comes to uh, the... uh, you know, I'm not going to say, decl- yeah, the, the slowdown that we've gotten in the economy and the prices that have uh, not risen as fast as they did last year. It's uh, not as shocking to buy that pear tree this year. It, it's not quite as shocking in general. I'm so delighted to be back with both of you. This is so fun, um, such <laughs> a is. fun annual project. I cannot believe we've been doing this. Well, not you and me, but the PNC has been doing this for 40 years. Wow. So it's the 40th anniversary. I'm not going to age or date myself <laughs> anywhere near. Wait, so what did extreme. it cost? Wait, so 1980s, first time, 83? 1984. Yeah. 19, do, you, do you remember what it cost? Oh my she God! Wasn't I doing was just right. a baby. I'm not going to do that. Well, I'm not going to do that to you. Okay, okay. It. All right. So talk to us about today's uh, today's tally. So, so last year, just to tee this up a little bit, last year the increase on a year-over-year basis was a whopping ten and a half percent. Right? We were yeah. right in the thick of a really hot inflationary um, environment. This year, I'm happy to report that we're gaining on it in getting this inflationary battle under control. And so, as per the Christmas Price Index, we're only up about 2.7 percent year over year. And so that equates to a little over $46,000 in total to buy all 12 days worth of the gifts. The long and variable lag <laughs> is hitting the 12 yeah, days of Christmas. I mean, I will tell you, though, Jay yeah. Powell would be happy to have inflation at 2.7%. You guys are well, you're doing the... Well, obviously, this yeah. is a key data point that the Fed uh, and the FOMC is very much focused on naturally, mm. right? <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? What do you guys find when you do this index how much it really does kind of tell you about 
where we are in the inflation cycle. And I went back to 1984, um, courtesy of you guys. It was $20,069.58. Yeah. It's a little many, perspective. Many, moons ago. Right? Yeah. A little perspective. I, I think the, the big thing for us is really trying to get a sense of the health of the consumer. So what is the consumer facing in any given holiday season? Where is the supply and demand sort of disconnect or perhaps alignment in any given year? And what does it ultimately mean for the path forward for markets and the economy? You know, consumption is such a huge component of growth over time. And so we got to make sure we understand uh, what the consumer trends look like. And so this is an important piece of analysis, though lighthearted. Um, it is, is an it, important piece of analysis. Is it really for us. like? Do you really like? You're like, okay, this shows us, you know, food costs or something. Like, it really does track with what's going on in the real economy. I think it does. You know, it's obviously a specialty gift basket uh, okay. of goods and services. And so it definitely is an indication of maybe the higher end uh, consumer discretionary oriented trends that the economy and consumers in general might be facing. But it is interesting to watch the trends from year to year. It does track uh, pretty nicely. Okay, so well, let's get to some of these individual items because uh, so, I want to make sure we get to, to all this, Amanda. There was actually no deflation in this. So there were certain items that don't cost any more than they did last year, but nothing actually went down in price. What sticks out to you? That sounds about right. Yeah, the so five of the gifts in the index, um, four calling birds, five gold rings, naturally my favorite gift, um, seven <laughs> swans of swimming, the eight maids and the nine ladies were all flat on a year-over-year -year basis. So if you're looking for a gift this holiday season, maybe those five gold rings are kind of a deal uh, on a relative basis here. Yeah, but don't try to buy Lords of Leapin, right? No, the, so we certainly saw an increase there. And I think this is an important tie in to what we're seeing in the services side of the economy. Try as the Fed might to get this inflationary backdrop under control. Services inflation tend to be pretty sticky. The Lord certainly fall into the live performances or services category. When we break it down between services and goods, uh, the services component of this index is up almost two times um, what the good side is. So pretty notable there. Uh, in terms of that dynamic. It's like the Taylor Swift effect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although Absolutely. the turtle doves, very pricey this year compared to last year. 25% um, higher? Why, why are turtle doves so much more expensive this year so than last year? So I think, well, on the one hand, it's a fairly limited supply uh, in terms of the breeders that we talk to. And, it's and the, the Bitcoin uh, of the uh, dove world, you're saying? <laughs> yeah, you could you could uh, equate it to that, but very limited supply. But I also think demand in this environment for specialty doves is perhaps a little bit less. I don't know that consumers are backing up the truck for specialty doves this holiday season. It's just kind of, uh, I love it. Is what? that on your list, Carol? What? Specialty doves this yeah. holiday season? Absolutely. Top partridge. of the list. What about a partridge? I'm more like a, a piper's tree. piping kind of guy. Well, that's going to be more expensive because the <laughs> price of musicians has gone up. That's right. Uh, that's exactly right. Did anything surprise you in this year's reading? I think two things probably surprised me the most. The, the one is that when we look at the core version of the index, so we try to mirror the BLS's methodology and we back out the most volatile component in the Christmas price index. It's food and energy for the BLS. For us, it's the swans. Um, and this year, the swans did not move at all. And so mm. I think that's pretty notable. It's the single biggest line item and it didn't move at all. Um, and so we sort of think about that as perhaps investors have been bracing for black swan sightings all year, mm, oh, nice. given recessionary concerns lingering that have failed to materialize. And then the other component is that the cost to shop online are up significantly. Uh, you're not going to get a deal this year in the Christmas price index by shopping online. So the convenience component of shopping online may allow us to slay our gift list all day, um, but it's definitely going to cost you. Why are the swans so expensive? Or they're not expensive? Why are they not? The swans are oh. expensive. They're the single biggest line item in general. Mm. And they tend oh. to move around a lot year oh, yeah, to yeah. year. Um, but, but yeah, not this year. Not this year. I haven't gone swan shopping in a while. I, I've actually never gone swan shopping. You should but, try it. Yeah. It's kind of fun. We yeah, should we, plan to do that in the We have Amanda Trip do it mall, so right? that she comes and tells us the price. <laughs> the Swan Mall. Amanda Gotti, you're so much fun. Happy holidays. Chief Investment Officer, PNC Asset Management on Zoom from Philly.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 421 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all declined today. A wave of selling in the final hour of trading. S&P closing at very close to session lows. Down 17 points today. Dropped there of four tenths of one percent. Dow Industrials down 70. A decline of two tenths of one percent. The NASDAQ Composite Index down 83 points. Dropped there of six tenths of one percent. The rally in bonds around the globe gained further traction with soft economic readings in both the U.S. and Europe, fueling speculation that major central banks will be cutting rates in the year to come. Ten-year yield today, 4.11 percent. The two-year, 4.60 percent. Spot gold up six and a half dollars the ounce to 2026, up by three tenths of one percent. Bitcoin down two tenths of one percent to 43,800 on Bitcoin. West Texas Intermediate Crude down 4.3 percent, 69.18 a barrel. Citigroup shares soared after. CFO Mark Mason said the Wall Street giant remains on track to deliver full-year revenue that is in line with the firm's earlier guidance despite a slump in trading revenue. Citigroup up 2.5% today. We had shares of J.P. Morgan Chase down by uh, just about uh, one-tenth of 1% 1 today. Actually down 1% on JPM. Bank of America down two-tenths of 1%. Wells Fargo just about unchanged on the day. Recapping stocks lower with a 17-point drop today in the S&P 500 index. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Well, the CEOs of some of the biggest U.S. banks, including Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, Brian Moynihan of Bank of America, and Jane Frazier of Citigroup spent much of the day testifying before the Senate Banking Committee. They made a lot of news. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they rallied against regulators' proposals to raise capital for the biggest banks. Here's J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon. We had 10 years to do this. And it's shocking to me that we're sitting up there 10 years and we're talking about what's it going to do for small business and we have to analyze it today. It was not thoughtfully done. I'm not sure it was shared fully among all the regulators. Uh, this should be we looked at. All right, that's Jamie Dimon, of course, CEO of J.P. Morgan up on Capitol Hill. He doesn't uh, mince words. No, he's not bashful at all. No, he's not. He went on to say that uh, they will hurt lower-income borrowers. Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon called the new rules, quote, punitive to economic growth. Oh, and Senator Elizabeth Warren actually found some common ground, Carol, with some bankers. Yeah, she did. Uh, Shanali Basik and Kat Doherty, they've been all over this story today. Shanali is Wall Street reporter for Bloomberg News. She's in our D.C. bureau, back from Capitol Hill, where she's been since the early hours of the morning. And and Kat, of course, is finance reporter here at Bloomberg News. She joins us uh, in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Shanali, let's start with you. It's an annual thing, but give us some uh, background, history, origin of these get-togethers between Wall Street and Washington. And I'm glad you're back in where it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was quite cold outside this morning. But yes, these hearings really started back uh, by Maxine Waters back in 2019 at the House. This year it wasn't at the House. It was mostly at the Senate. Uh, and so the Senate really has shepherded this since 2021 under the leader leadership of uh, Ohio Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown. There were a lot of reasons that this was happening happening. One is a lot of concern about banking services in low-income communities, in rural communities across America, uh, right before the pandemic, really, a couple years before the pandemic, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. That was a really important moment in all of this as well, because the banks were really pressed on their commitments to racial equity across America, why black homeowners were not getting mortgages at the same rate in a refinancing boom in really the lowest interest rates we've seen in a generation. Generation. And now on the flip side, they're getting questions in the other direction. Why is it so hard for everyone to get a mortgage? Why are they retreating from the mortgage business at such a flat, fast clip? And a lot of that they can blame on regulation, and they certainly are using this moment to blame regulation for why they are getting out of certain businesses in certain areas across America. But, I mean, <clears throat> regulation is one thing, but mortgages are down because rates are up, Kat. So, you know, the Fed has raised rates to tame inflation. And when you see the rise in so rates, you see the big mortgages banks, get more expensive. The big banks backing out of the mortgage business is has really, it was before 
interest rates started going up. Um, and it tracks back to, it, or it comes down to, is it a profitable business? And okay. Diamond had a quote today where he basically talked about um, loans. It could apply to mortgages, it, just lending in general. When these banks are looking at each business line, especially the big ones like B of A and, and JP Morgan that have different uh, units that all have to report up to the one entity that ends up saying how much revenue they're generating each year, and they have to show that to shareholders. If there is something that is not making them money, and it ends up like the math doesn't work out, they're going to make that business decision to say, this is not something that is benefiting our business. And, and they do have to, the only reason that like a Bank of America hasn't exited completely from mortgages is because they want to be a provider for their clients uh, in a wholesome way. So if you have a, a someone that has a checking account, a saving account with you, and then they come and they say, I also want to have a mortgage with you, they want to say, okay, we can do that as well. But they're not doing it in a big way. They're not going out and you, I, I don't think that you would, I would be surprised to see an advertisement from one of the big banks saying, hey, uh, you can have a mortgage with us because it's not something that they're touting. That's interesting. Um, so it, it, it really isn't tied to interest rates going up. You make a good point of where we're at today and that there aren't as many folks out there looking for mortgages because people are sitting and waiting for interest rates to go down. So Yes, in, in this economic environment, um, the banks uh, even and non-banks that provide mortgages aren't lending as much um, for housing, but that doesn't have to do with the bank's business decision to back out of that business. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. I think about the Wells Fargo remote that we did that really trying to, I mean, they've got a lot of issues or have for years, but really trying to move in terms of their diversity lending and um, because there's been a lot of criticism for them specifically. Shanali, um, what stood out for you? in terms of the questioning. It's always kind of remarkable when I see like a pan of a camera against these very notable CEOs, many of them, most of them, a lot of them, household names, like we know who they are, people in general do, and we follow them very closely. So what was notable for you? One moment that was the most notable was the exchange that Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is typically the toughest on the banks, uh, that she had with the bank CEOs. She seems to have turned her focus very largely to crypto. She has been very focused on the abuses in the crypto industry, particularly when it comes to anti money laundering. And she asked each of the bankers whether they agreed that those crypto firms should be sub subject to the same anti money laundering rules that the banking system is today. Each of them said absolutely. <laughs> and so you have this. This strange moment that hasn't happened for years so publicly where Elizabeth Warren and the banking system were on the same side. I did catch up with her right after the hearing in person as well and one thing I asked her that she would not explicitly answer is whether she would be willing to regulate the private capital system and this is a yeah. system for example private credit has ballooned to a 1.5 trillion dollar industry so far and fast growing and that's where the bankers are trying to draw their attention to saying that if you squeeze us more, most of the activity is going to non-banks. They point to private right. credit in particular, but even the mortgage system is now the top three by uh, the number of mortgages originated last year. None of them are the big banks. Wow. Kat, I feel like the big banks... That's just nodding your head in here. The publicly, right, they've got to be bristling, right? Well, yeah, she's, I mean, Shanali's tying it all together, right? Like, when when you talk about the, the CEO showing up today, and they were just guns a-blazing going after uh, new regulation that they're facing, and, and there was a big emphasis on saying, if you do this, we, they said, number one, we'll be able to handle it. It's not as if our balance sheets aren't strong enough to, uh, to take whatever you're throwing at us. However, we're going to back away and this will push businesses uh, or th if the businesses that we back away from or we're like pulling back because we have to abide by this new regulation, others will step in. And that, that means that the activity that you're trying to regulate will just move to uh, an area that you can't even see what's going on. The so-called shadow banking The shadow area. banking, um, the mm -hmm. private credit market. Uh, so it, it really, it, it's an interesting, like you, you see the activity already happening right. and they're capitalizing on that. They're trying to point out that it, the, the intention of Basel III might actually 
start moving the activity and, and be the opposite. It might be into an area that's not protected, not regulated. If I have time, I want to ask this of both of you, but are they right, Shanali? And I mean, just as both of you, you know, look at private credit or the private world, you look at obviously the publicly uh, held banks, um, you know, increasingly we're just seeing that private lending world just kind of continue to grow and be a bigger part of kind of the lending world. And I do wonder, we all wonder, you know, what's going on that we don't know about? Listen, uh, there's a really interesting report that we're going to be writing about later this week that basically cites that, um, and it's a giant in the industry that's going to be talking about how private credit is uh, actually a bigger problem in terms of potential defaults in the future because mm -hmm. it's hidden all those problems and they're medium and small businesses, although not so small that you know they're still missing a large swath of society here. Can we also just talk about how much the narrative has shifted? Because this used to be a quite hostile affair mm -hmm. in the last several years the last couple of years they had these hearings and it's almost like the tides have shift, shifted. The banks have understood that they need to play ball with these regulators and these lawmakers. If they play ball in some ways, then they get other things in return. And by the way, they were the big saviors of the industry this year. They got together, they put capital together to make sure that one bank yeah. didn't fail in a disorderly That's manner. You know, it's amazing how they have, and it's, I've got to say, you know, I, I this morning, the first thing I saw this morning was David Solomon hanging out with James Gorman and, and, and Brian Moynihan <laughs> coming to meet them. And it's kind of like they've all gotten their act together. They have a coordinated message. And their message is, we play a role here. We play an important role here. You're not going to want to uh, shunt us too badly because you need us. And the lawmakers seem to fall in line with that story. They know how to play the game. They're walking in here today, and they have a strategy. We, um, yeah. They're... they're we, they're saying, like, here we are, and we showed up during the regional banking crisis. It's a really good point. Guys, we have to run. Love it. This was such a good roundtable. Shanali Basik and Kat Doherty joining us in studio. Hey, let's get to Washington to see Nancy Lyons is standing by with World and National News. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Tim. Las Vegas police say there are multiple victims following a shooting on the campus of the University of Nevada. Some were reportedly killed. They say the suspect was later found dead about 40 minutes after the first shots were fired. This all happened at Beam Hall, which is the home of UNLV's business school. This woman was on campus when it happened. At least one of my friends, she was in the business building, just ran out, hopped fences, got to the car as fast as possible. Police will soon give an update on that situation. President Biden in a national address today reprimanded Republicans in Congress over stalled talks to pass a new round of aid to Ukraine. The GOP wants immigration reform as any part of an aid package. Republicans think they get everything they want without any bipartisan compromise. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. And now they're willing to literally kneecap Ukraine on the battlefield and damage our national security in the process. He was the first House Speaker to be kicked out of his position. Now Kevin McCarthy is taking himself out of the House entirely. The Republican from Bakersfield, California, made the announcement in a Wall Street Journal essay and on this video posted on X. While I'll be departing the House at the end of this year, I will never, ever give up fighting for this country that I love so much. McCarthy came to office in 2010 with a wave of Tea Party Republicans. It took 15 votes for him to become speaker in January, a tenure that lasted just nine months. That's Nathan Hager reporting. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 4.40 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg, and we begin with a developing story headline right off the Bloomberg Professional Service. AbV is said to be nearing a deal to acquire Cerevel Therapeutics for around $45 a share. That, according to Reuters, citing unidentified people familiar with the matter. A story we're tracking right now turned out to be a down day. In fact, a week closed at just about the lows of the session. Today, the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all finishing very much in the red. S P down 17, dropped the day of about four tenths of one percent to 45.49. The Dow was down 70 points today, a decline of two tenths of one percent. The Dow just above 36,000 at 36,054. Nasdaq, the composite index, down 83 today, a drop there of uh, just about six tenths of one percent. Ten-year yield 4.11 percent. Two-year 4.59 percent. Gold up six dollars the ounce to 2025, up by about three tenths of one percent. While West Texas. Texas Intermediate Crude today down 4%. WTI now at 69.26 a barrel. So what about the Federal Reserve and the rate cut outlook? Nadia Lovell is senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management, and she was a guest right here on Bloomberg Business Week. We actually think that the market current pricing is a bit aggressive. We've seen this massive pendulum swing to two dovish a bit too quickly from our you know, hard pivot from higher for longer. And now the market is priced it in over 130 basis points for cuts next year. I mean, even Chairman Powell tried to push back on this last week, even though a bit unsuccessful. And you can hear more of that conversation on the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts. Citigroup shares up today by 2.5% after CFO Mark Mason said the Wall Street giant remains on track to deliver full-year revenue that is in line with the firm's earlier guidance despite a slump in trading revenue. Among some of the other banks that were testifying in D.C. today, J.P. Morgan Chase lower by 1%, Bank of America down by about 2%, uh, two-tenths of 1%. Wells Fargo shares ended the day little changed. Again, recapping stocks lower, late-day sell-off, S&P down 17, dropped there of four-tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Carol Master, along with Tim Stanovic, live here on Bloomberg Business Week. Well, um, it's going to be another year where we are focusing big time on artificial intelligence. You know that as we go into 2024. The chip sector is one to watch because there's one dominant player, and that has been NVIDIA, which is the top performer in the S&P 500. Socks up more than 40%. But don't miss out on what AMD is doing, Tim. This stock, too, up 80% so far this year. Yeah, the company taking aim at a bird market dominated by NVIDIA. It's unveiled a new so-called accelerator chip that it says will be able to run AI software faster than rival products. The company introduced its long-anticipated lineup, Carol. It's called the MI300 at an event Wednesday in San Jose. And uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to hear from um, Lisa Sue, the company CEO. Yeah, looking forward to it. Sitting down with our own uh, Ed Ludlow. Launch is one of the most important in AMD's 50-year history, setting up, really, for that showdown with NVIDIA in the red-hot market for AI accelerators. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, these chips help develop AI models by essentially bombarding them with data, a task they handle more deeply than traditional computer processors. And that's what we know AI is all about, right? All of this data makes advanced generative uh, AI so much smarter, smarter, excuse me, and really useful. And you need the chips, though, these accelerator chips to do it. Hence why NVIDIA has done so well over the last mm -hmm. year. Hey, AMD is showing increasing confidence that this new lineup can actually win over some of the biggest names in tech, potentially diverting billions in spending toward the company. Customers using the processor will include Microsoft, Oracle, and Meta Platforms. That's according to AMD. Yeah, and it's interesting. We're going to get wonky, but, I mean, this new chip uh, from AMD has more than 150 billion transistors, 2.4 times as much memory as NVIDIA's H100, the current market leader. It also has 1.6 as much memory bandwidth, further boosting performance. This is all coming from AMD, but this is what it's all about. And Ian King, we should note, who <laughs> knows a thing or two about this stuff. Or and three or four or five yeah. or six. Yeah, it's not easy. 
No, but it's it's you know helping explain. We you know every company that seems to come on, every guest, uh, often we get eventually into the world of artificial intelligence. So it's uh, so much about it, and we need these chips. So anyway, over to Bloomberg Technologies, Ed Ludlow with AMD CEO Lisa Su. And radio audiences worldwide, we are live here in San Jose with Lisa Su. The CEO of AMD, it's been an incredibly busy day for you, but there's a lot of emphasis on the importance of MI300X, your latest AI accelerator. But the technological difference vis-a-vis -vis the H100, NVIDIA's, is uh, HBM3, high bandwidth memory. But what advantage does that give you in the immediate term against what is a clear market incumbent? in the space. Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's great to be here. Thank you guys for uh, being on site and spending so much time with us today. Um, it's been a big, big day for AMD. We're so excited about, uh, first, the opportunity in AI is just absolutely exploding. Um, and then we're talking today about the launch of our MI300X, which is our, you know, let's call it the, the leading edge uh, data center uh, AI accelerator. And, you know, we were here with a lot of our partners as well. So, you know, your, your, your comment about, you know, what's special about MI300X, I mean, the, the truth is, uh, we've all experienced over the last, you know, 12 months this incredible revolution, right? Um, you know, ChatGPT has has really changed the way we think about what tech can do, and the underlying capability of that is GPUs and you know very very capable GPUs. Um, you know, we made some very very good decisions, um, you know, a few years ago about how to put together this technology, and that includes. Um, both being very good for training, so training large models, um, but also very good for um, answering questions or inference. So when you ask you know, the, uh, ChatGPT a question, um, it takes sometimes a little bit of time for it to respond to an answer. Some latency. There's some latency there, and um, you know, we found uh, you know, really a great technological solution by adding you know, lots of um, high bandwidth memory or memory capacity. Uh, Which and NVIDIA will not have until H200, second quarter of next year. Uh, that is correct. We are industry leaning, uh, so you know, best in class in terms of inference performance. And um, what, what is the side by side, Lisa, on training and performance? Mi three hundred X versus H one hundred. Yeah. So if you look at, um, and we showed some of the benchmarks um, earlier today. If you look at training performance, um, we're very very competitive. Let's call it, you know, it's it's a toss up. When you look at inference performance, uh, we're one point four to one point six times better. And you know what that means is, you know, if you're running these models, you can actually run more models, or you can run larger models, um, you know, with uh, MI300. And, and right now, you know, the key to AI is GPU compute. I mean, that is absolutely what everybody says. And, and so we're here to provide lots of GPU compute. You've had the confidence to dramatically alter your your forecast for this market for AI accelerators. You're saying a total addressable market of 400 billion US dollars in 2027. In August, just in August, you said it was 150 billion. What has changed? Yeah, and you know, uh, really, the way we look at these things is we usually look at these things on an annual basis. And so, you know, when we were, you know, doing our plan for 2023 and beyond last year, uh, we thought that um, you know this year there would be about a 30 billion dollar market, and it would grow, you know, 50 percent um, compound annual growth rate. So, be about 150 billion in 2027. Uh, which frankly was very, very large. Um, but what's changed is we, we can all see what's changed, right? People need more compute. They're installing more. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers for this year are probably closer to 45 billion. And when we talk to customers, when I spend time with our partners, and um, you know, what they tell us is uh, the technology requires more compute. And so we now believe the total market for this, um, it's upwards of 400 billion in 2027. It's huge. Uh, there's no one size fits all. There are going to be multiple solutions. Um, there are lots of good solutions um, out there today, but uh, we, we believe the AMD capability is uh, you know, very significant. And, and so we're excited about it. It was interesting to see on stage how MI300X manifests itself in the real world, but you'd already guided us that it will likely be the, the quickest AMD product to $1 billion. There were sections of the market in the street that said your forecast of $2 billion of sales for MI300X in 24 was conservative. If you're saying that the total addressable market by 2027 is now $400 billion, then 
is that two billion forecast for next year specifically for the MI300X conservative as the market <laughs> thinks it is? Well, I think we have to take a step back and just look at how this technology is evolving. So, uh, you know, we did update in our last, um, you know, conference call to an expectation of about two billion in 2024 uh, for our data center GPUs. Um, it's a very early estimate. Um, I would say, you know, we have clear line of sight to that. Uh, but, you know, what people ask me is, you know, like, there's much more customer demand, definitely, and there's also um, you know, significantly more supply because we've had to prepare the supply chain so that we're ready to ramp. So we'll update as we go along. You know, we, we are um, you know, definitely on this path to ramp um, MI300 uh, the fastest as anything's ever ramped. At, at AMD, and you know, I view this as a multi-year opportunity for us. Uh, a reminder to our Bloomberg television and radio audience worldwide, we're live with Lisa Su, the AMD CEO here in San Jose. I mean, supply is a key question, because when you say about $2 billion, about could mean less or more than $2 billion, but what is the state of supply right now? Has it improved such that actually you could exceed your expectations because you have visibility on a greater volume of GPUs to hand over to customers. Yeah, for sure. When we plan, um, we plan for success. And so our planning has um, the capability to be significantly higher than $2 billion. Um, We have you know, customer demand, you know, sort of lots and lots of interest uh, for MI300. And I think the key for us is you know, one step at a time. Right? Today was a, a huge day in terms of launch. Uh, we're actively in deployment with a number of the customers and partners, you know, Microsoft on stage, Oracle, Meta, um, our OEM partners, Dell, Lenovo, Supermicro. Um, everyone is um, you know, really doing just phenomenal HPE on the MI300A side. So um, a great, great set of partners and a great partnerships um, for us to ramp as, as fast as possible. What's happening right now is you have AMD coming to the cutting edge with MI300X by adding HBM3. NVIDIA has the H100, H200 is coming, they have Grasshopper Superchip. And at the same time, the hyperscalers are really aggressively investing in their own silicon. How does that work in practice? If you're trying to yeah. say, I've got the cutting edge in AI accelerators, and the hyperscalers saying, I also have the cutting edge in, in AI accelerators, are you competitors? Are you collaborators? Which is it? I, I think we are first and foremost collaborators. I mean, you know. I, what we see that's really happening is everybody realizes the foundation is the silicon compute. So of course people are going to invest in silicon. Um, now, from my standpoint, um, compute is hard, and it's especially hard if you're trying to address the bleeding edge. So, you know, our expectation is there will be solutions, there will be some proprietary solutions, there will be a lot of GPUs. You know, in my $400 billion TAM, I would say it's um, predominantly GPUs. And um, we work in collaboration, so there will be multiple solutions, but for the largest language models, for the most complex workloads, uh, we believe that we're extremely well positioned. Actually, a question from our Bloom technology audience globally when I said that you were coming on the, on the show is take that TAM for 2027, 400 billion, but tell us how much of it is, is driven by inference and how much of, is driven by training because there's a chance that a lot of the training is complete by then. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I don't think the training will be complete by then because I think there will be a desire to continue to get better to, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, what we're really looking for is, you know, how does AI really become um, you know, as sophisticated and as capable as, as humans, there's still a lot that we can do. Um, but that being the case, um, we do view that the, um, the inference market will even grow faster, uh, that will be even more queries. And so, you know, if I look at 2027, I think more than half the market will be inference. More than half inference. Yes. Where is it right now? It's, 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 it's predominantly training right now as people are training. And I, and I mean in the context specifically of demand for MI300X. Yeah, so if I think about um, the market today, there's a lot of training. I think if you think about MI300X and what we see in 2024, um, it's a good balance between training and inference. But certainly on inference, um, we just have killer performance. So a, a lot of the chatter that I hear in the Valley is no matter how good the GPUs are, in some places the software that comes with it and manages it is not that good. And one of the questions put to me for you is, is how much are you going to invest in software and how good do you think you are at software? Yeah, look, we've spent um, a significant amount of resources, both organically and inorganically. Um, we just acquired a couple of companies um, to augment our software resource standpoint. Uh, we think we're very well positioned. Um, today we announced our next generation, Rockham uh, 6. 
uh, which is really designed for gen AI workloads. I know it's a little bit of a detail. Um, what customers are telling us is MI300 is actually really easy to use. Um, you know, we've gotten sort of the yes. heavy lifting done. Uh, we've really focused on these higher level frameworks. So, you know, people really like uh, actually building models and building um, their applications in uh, PyTorch. And, you know, PyTorch is um, an open ecosystem. It works very, very well with AMD. And so these are, you know, some of many steps. We announced this morning that uh, OpenAI Triton is also, um, you know, optimizing with AMD on their next revision. Yes. So we're making a lot of progress. And for sure, um, I think on the software side, we're, we're absolutely ready. Lisa, even in the short time I've been in Silicon Valley, six years, people have said AMD won't do it. They won't, they won't beat, they won't enter the market. Intel will beat them on PC. In the context of AI, will you beat NVIDIA or will you be competitive? You know, uh, what I'd like to say is uh, we are very, very focused on our roadmap, Ed. I have to say, um, this is about um, what do we believe is important for the market and how are we shooting for um, you know, where the market is going. So yeah, I think we're going to do great in AI. I mean, I think AI is our number one priority. Hopefully that was clear today. Uh, you know, we've pivoted the company to really focus on AI. I think there are going to be multiple winners in AI. And as, you know, kind of important as the cloud is, we think enterprise is really important. We think HPC is very important. We think PCs are very important. And, you know, this is kind of the, the next big wave in tech. AMD CEO Lisa Su, thank you. This is Bloomberg. All right, a big thank you to Ed Ludlow there with Lisa Sue, the CEO of AMD. A wide-ranging interview, Carol, where they uh, really the, the, the nut of it was about this new NVIDIA chip rival and the company giving this huge forecast for what it thinks the uh, entire industry can see in the next few years. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, right? But I do think, you know, you think about big fundamental changes technologically that potentially move the needle. Yeah. And you can safely say that generative AI is certainly something that do, does that. I'm looking at AMD, AMD excuse me, in the aftermarket. It's just about mm, a little gain of about four tenths of a percent. Well, I think the big question for AMD and for investors, too, is that can they, act, can they actually catch up to what NVIDIA has done? And it's a question that I've asked uh, our own Ian King, who covers this space and wrote a great piece on this earlier in the day. I encourage everybody to check it out at Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. And uh, he said that it's tough to find anyone out there who at this point can compete with NVIDIA. That said, it was before this announcement. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Having yeah, having said that, they're all going to try. It's just like, you know, it's interesting some of the different races that are going on. You have on. to try. The diet drugs that are going on. Like everybody's trying yeah. to, you know, replicate, create their own version of it. Um, this chip... Uh, you know, certainly everybody's going after NVIDIA. I would say they have first mover advantage. We talk about that with someone like an Elon Musk, you know, kind of out there front and center. But, you know, when it comes to the world of technology, you have to be, I would never rule somebody out, especially somebody like an aggressive player like AMD. Well, speaking of aggressive, check out this forecast. AMD predicts that AI processor, uh, processors will grow into a $400 billion market. Uh, the, five, the entire market, so that's just AI processors. Mm -hmm. According to IDC, the entire chip industry in 2022 was $600 billion. Wow. Isn't wow. that incredible? So you realize how, how big this market is. Or well, that's what AMD says it's going to be. Correct. Isn't that incredible? And they certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and hope to then, be a player uh, in it. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Sue said it could climb to more than $400 billion in the next four years. Uh, you know, we will see. I mean, you look at the enthusiasm that we've seen in NVIDIA, and I just remember when that first earnings report came out, you know, uh, as NVIDIA had taken off, and the questions were, will they deliver in terms of the actual numbers and the growth? And they have, and they have repeatedly, uh, which explains why this stock is your top performer uh, 